good morning. My name is Sophie Baum. I'm the editor-in-chief um, of the Michigan Technology Law Review. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, Dean Barr, I want to say a few words and acknowledge um, lots of the people and organizations that help make the symposium possible. Um, so my first thank you is to all of you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for showing up. I felt sometimes like I was planning a kid's birthday party and like no one was going to come, but you guys came. So that's great. Um, as a reward, we have lots of food for you today. We have Zingerman's breakfast um, down the hall, so feel free to go and grab some now before Dean Barr starts. Um, we've got lunch coming, Jerusalem Garden. We've got Washtenaw Dairy, um, so make sure to stick around all day for that. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, of course, University of Michigan Ford School of Public Policy and the Center on Finance, Law, and Policy. Um, Christy Baer was a huge help in uh, helping with recruiting speakers and creating promotional materials for the symposium, so we're very grateful to her. Um, our networking snack breaks are generously sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Information Technology Services, the Information Assurance Team, and Dissonance, a university-wide group that brings together technology researchers, scholars, and students for discussions and campus-wide events. Saul Berman, the University of Michigan's Chief Privacy Officer and Interim Chief Information Security Officer, kindly worked to secure this donation, so we appreciate it. Thanks especially to our biggest sponsor, the University of Michigan Law School, uh, for reviewing and selecting our symposium proposal. We're so fortunate to have had the law school's support and guidance throughout the entire process. Thanks especially to Dean Marti for his leadership and to Jenny Rickard, who, if you don't know her, is a logistics like rock star, wizard, queen, all of it. She's great. Um, and finally, thank you so much to the members of the Michigan Technology Law Review for your enthusiasm in putting this day together. Um, Andre Rouillard, standing right there, uh, has been incredible throughout the process. He was involved in everything from conceptualizing panels to recruiting speakers, making dinner reservations, printing flyers, ordering catering. You get the idea, the whole deal. Um, so he um, and the whole journal is really at the heart of today's symposium. And we couldn't have done it without all of you. So please enjoy. Thanks. Um, now, I know you'd all like to get the day started, so I won't talk for too much longer. Uh, but I did want to let you know that today is not just a symposium on data privacy and portability in financial technology. That is still a mouthful after all these months. Um, it's also a celebration of our journal's 25th anniversary. And this may not sound like a long time compared to some law reviews, but for a tech journal, it's a pretty big deal. Um, some of our current members were not even alive when we got off the ground. <laughs> so I'm thrilled that some of our alumni are here to celebrate with us too. Um, one of them recently sent us a photo from 1996 um, with a note explaining that the editors shown in the photo were in our first office, which was the IT guy's closet in the library basement. Uh, the room had a shower in it, because apparently it was originally a makeshift dorm room for the women law students uh, back in the day. So technically our office is still in the basement, um, but needless to say, we've come a long way. So to celebrate that, I want to remind everyone that there will be a happy hour to mark our anniversary after the symposium. We'll be walking over to Ravens Club downtown after we wrap up here. Um, I'm under strict instructions to say that the event is not technically connected with the symposium and we are not using any symposium money to fund it. So <laughs> check on compliance. <laughs> uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dean Barr. Uh, Um, his reputation precedes him. Uh, Michael Barr is the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of Public Policy at the University of Michigan Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy and serves as the faculty director of the Center on Finance, Law, and Policy. He's a professor of public policy at the Ford School and the Roy F. and Jean Humphrey Prophet Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School. Dean Barr is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and previously at the Brookings Institution. He served under President Obama as the US Department of the Treasury's Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions and was a key architect in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. In the Clinton administration, Dean Barr served as Special Advisor to the President, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, 
Treasury for Community Development Policy, Special Assistant to the Treasury Secretary, and Special Advisor and Counselor on the Public Planning Staff at the State Department. So again, please well, join me in welcoming Dean Barr. Thank you very much, Sophie, and congratulations to you and to the other uh, members of the Michigan Law and Technology um, Law Review. It's really a, a great um, honor to be here and to see um, uh, so many friends. And I uh, look forward to um, uh, hearing uh, a little bit more um, from you today. I want to apologize in advance that I can't um, stay uh, much after um, my talk this morning, but um, I uh, look forward to hearing about the results of um, the day's events. And I guess I'll miss the um, completely separate happy hour um, <laughs> later tonight. What I thought I would do is um, frame up the discussion um, for the conference today by talking a little bit about um, why uh, data ownership uh, matters. And in a big picture sense, um, I think uh, the central questions we're talking about today involve empowering consumers um, to have more control over their financial lives. So figuring out ways that we can um, really make a difference in people's lives. So, you know, sometimes we get um, caught up in the, um, in the technical questions about, um, you know, this or that privacy provision, this or that liability rule. But all of those, I think, ought to be in service of having a, a market that is competitive and vibrant and innovative and that empowers consumers to make um, better financial decisions, better choices, and uh, choices that enhance their um, personal lives. So uh, what does um, having better control over your financial data uh, mean? Um, in part, it means knowing what's going on in your life having a sense that um, uh, instead of things happening to you, you um, understand um, the information around you and you're able to act on that uh, information. It could mean uh, budgeting more effectively. Having access to information um, can help uh, individuals get better control over their lives. There's, um, uh, for many, many households, uh, there's enormous uncertainty and variability in their daily financial lives. The flow of income um, that they get uh, goes up and down quite a lot. Uh, for many um, households, their expenses are also really variable. Uh, they can uh, get hit with a, um, uh, a car bill uh, or uh, an unexpected illness that's not covered by insurance, and that throws them off um, for a long time. So having a better ability to um, manage both uh, cash flows in and cash flows out uh, and potentially uh, to be able to save a bit um, for uh, those kinds of, um, you might think of them as fully anticipated emergencies since they happen so often. Uh, but to, to have a little cushion, a little emergency cushion is really important. Um, there are all kinds of positive spillovers from having that ability to budget better and potentially to save. Um, one of them, um, for example, is uh, overdrafting on your bank account uh, less often. So uh, in any um, given year, overdraft um, costs consumers uh, between 32 and $34 billion. So it's a huge drain on the finances of people who can ill afford that kind of a cost or fee. So if we can give people better access to information, better ownership of their own information, and tools to manage that, uh, we're gonna protect them from a lot of potential harm. And lastly, I think, or not lastly, but another important example of this, I think, is um, that having better control over one's financial data uh, will make it easier to switch banks. Um, or as I put it in an op-ed a couple of years ago, it ought to be easier to dump your bank. Uh, it ought to be easier to switch um, from one bank account uh, to another. Now, why does, that, why does that matter? It matters because 
the stickiness of our relationship with our bank makes it easier for banks to impose all kinds of costs on us that a fully competitive market where it was easy to switch would reduce. So if it was easier to move your bank from, move from one bank to another, it would be harder for banks to impose gotcha fees, to impose insufficient fund fees, to impose high overdraft fees, or to just have bad, um, a bad customer service. So a fully portable system, a system where we can easily take all of our data from our bank and move it to another bank would be a much more competitive system and a system that would reduce fees, uh, increase competition, and I think increase innovation in the market. Uh, so improved legal rules about data ownership, improved access to the information, improved ability to port your information from one financial institution to another can, I think, dramatically increase competition innovation in the, in the industry and reduce fees and costs on consumers. <clears throat> now, um, there are all kinds of um, issues with developing new rules that would enable better consumer ownership. Um, one of those um, uh, key areas is privacy, a, a central concern um, uh, for many is um, how do I know that the data I've given away um, is being protected in some way, protected from a security standpoint that I'll get to in a second, but for now I mean protected from uses that I didn't anticipate. And in the current world we live in, the answer is you can't. Um, much of the data that you provide to um, to others is used for all kinds of purposes beyond whatever was in your head when you gave up that information. If, if you had something in your head about why you were giving up that information, um, it's widely used for, um, for other purposes and um, uh, you know, consumers um, routinely um, either consent to things they don't fully understand or are not required in many instances to consent um, to, the, to the use of that uh, personal financial information. So I think that's an important area that needs to get um, fixed if we're gonna have, um, if we're gonna have better uh, portability of financial data. Um, in addition to not knowing whether the information is being provided, the information you provide is being used for the use you intended, um, uh, this data provision can also be used by others in unintended ways, even by those who you've given it to. So the information can be used by thieves, um, of course, uh, we're worried about. Uh, but, but also information might flow to those whose behavior um, is not ideal in the marketplace. Abusive debt collector, uh, collectors or uh, predatory lenders who are taking advantage of that access to data to provide services that can be extremely harmful to consumers. So we're worried about it from that perspective uh, as well. And data ownership also raises really important issues of access uh, and equity. Uh, so um, uh, unsophisticated um, consumers are more at risk. Low and moderate income consumers are more at risk. Minority communities are more at risk. Women are more at risk than men in um, finding, having these abuses take place in the marketplace. And I think that raises important issues um, of equity. Uh, and beyond that, um, many uses of data uh, end up reinforcing problems that already exist in the marketplace. So in many instances, um, uh, uh, data can be um, unintentionally reinforcing of problems of uh, lending discrimination. Uh, so uh, we have this um, wonderful new um, uh, system of thinking about uh, how to use big data to expand the pool of people that are lent to. Um, but big data can also lead to reinforcing discrimination in markets. So 
Um, if you feed into your big data machine a set of information about historical connections, um, even if the machine is told not to discriminate on the basis of race, the algorithm can end up replicating and reinforcing problems in lending discrimination. Uh, so access and equity issues are also extremely important in thinking about um, who owns data and what it is uh, actually used for. Um, I mentioned that in addition to privacy, we're worried about security. So in addition to worrying about what intended uses um, are being made of the data, um, we're also worried about whether the institutions that we're providing data to are themselves secure and can protect our data from um, illicit uh, use. And there is a, um, a, a wide variety of capacity to protect data in the marketplace today, from institutions who are quite sophisticated and good at it um, to uh, institutions that are um, uh, struggling with it. But even institutions that are quite good at it um, have found themselves um, subject to uh, significant uh, data breaches, uh, data breaches that expose our information um, to illicit use. Uh, and that, I think, is a problem that's not going to go away. It's getting worse. Um, the attacks on the financial sector are uh, becoming much more sophisticated and harder to protect against over time. There's also a differential ability among financial institutions to back up their commitment to protect security. So uh, if, you're, um, uh, if you're a startup and you um, happen to have really good um, security mechanisms, you're really super co committed to it, uh, but a data breach nonetheless happens, there's less there to insulate consumers, to protect consumers if if something goes wrong. If you're a big institution, you have more capital, um, you uh, can, at least in theory, um, re recompense um, individuals who are harmed. Um, I mentioned at the outset that um, it's often the case that uh, consumers don't really um, fully understand um, what they're consenting to or in some instances are not required to consent at all for the sharing of uh, personal financial information. Um, and this is an issue that uh, countries around the world struggle with, but I think we have to figure out some method for developing more meaningful consent, um, actual consent that people could, at least in theory, understand, although I'm, I'm going to give you a caveat in just a moment. Um, so. Um, what are some of the kinds of elements that you might think about in thinking about um, consent? Um, one of them is, um, perhaps the most obvious, is comprehension. So can we develop ways for articulating what it is that, that consumers are um, consenting to in their forms? Um, is there a way of breaking down the consent uh, in such a way that um, consumers might reasonably thought, think um, that, they, that they understand what actually they're um, consenting to. Uh, but a second, um, I think, important consideration is reasonableness. That is, I don't think that we ought to have um, a situation where financial institutions can seek consent for something that is unreasonable. That is, uh, it, it may be that you know, consent is a good tool to help us choose between things that reasonable people might disagree about. They would want that or they wouldn't want this. But we ought to have some substantive limits on the ability of financial institutions to use data in ways that reasonable people would find um, that it's not something they would expect as a use of that data. Uh, and I think that... Um, both a, a procedural a test with respect to comprehension and a reasonableness test um, ought to be part of the a picture. I think there are also um, two other techniques that are um, really worth exploring as we think about ways to make consent more meaningful. Um, one of those is time-limited consent, and the other is use-limited consent. So in time-limited consent, I would say, 
uh, permit a financial institution to use my data for the next um, you know, two days to decide whether or not to make me a loan. And the use, um, the, the limit they are both time and use. So the time limit is the firm can only use my data for two days. And the use limit is for the purpose of deciding whether to make me a loan. Uh, so time and use limitations might give us better control over why we're giving our financial information away. Um, it can only be used for a certain time and for a certain purpose. I think that's an important uh, potential uh, 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 tool. And uh, lastly, there are um, lots of situations in which essentially consumers um, need to opt out if they don't want to have their information shared. And I think our basic model ought to uh, be always an opt-in model. That is, uh, if, you're, if the financial institution would like to use or the provider would like to use your information, that you need to affirmatively say that that is a permissible use of that information. And I think all these techniques would make, uh, potentially make consent more robust. Um, what are some of the uh, key barriers to making progress um, in this space of uh, data portability and data ownership? Um, one uh, major concern has been um, that in many instances banks are really uneager to share uh, the information um, either with the consumer or with third parties. Um, and uh, you can see this from the bank perspective. Um, a, a bank is um, unlikely to want to share information with a third party provider for, for really um, uh, two central reasons. The first central reason is that uh, providing that information to a third party means that that third party might get the customer instead of the bank. So um, the bank may be giving up uh, revenue um, uh, for doing so. Um, and the second is that um, sharing with that third party may open up the bank to concerns about uh, security or privacy violations that will end up uh, with liability at the bank itself. Uh, and those two reasons have really um, slowed uh, data portability in the United States. There's been some progress in this regard with data sharing agreements that are being built one by one with third party providers and uh, individual financial institutions. But there's no unified um, framework in the United States for resolving these questions and that's inhibited um, the flow um, and increase in data portability. Um, the, um, uh, a second major concern with respect to the um, sharing of data has to do with uh, problems in liability allocation. So the rules in the United States are quite unclear about um, uh, how risk is allocated between banks and third party providers in the event of a data breach. Um, and, uh, it is um, often the case that um, it is the sort of uh, facts and circumstances tests used to decide uh, liability um, are very difficult to work through, and that lack of clarity on the liability allocation inhibits the sharing of that uh, information. Um, and uh, another key um, barrier, I think, in this is that um, there just isn't enough consumer voice um, at the table in conversations about how to develop the rules for data portability, how to share information um, between banks and third party providers. There are, isn't enough, um, you know, even in the conversations that, that have happened that are advancing the ball on uh, between uh, third party providers and banks, there's insufficient attention to having consumer voice at the table in those decisions. Uh, consumer groups, community groups, um, uh, uh, state AGs, um, uh, and others who might uh, be able to provide a perspective that is a consumer-focused, human-centered focused approach, not one focused on just the question about the way in which the financial sector gets together on this. Um, and uh, if you think about um, uh, these um, kinds of barriers, uh, another significant issue is the 
a wide uh, variation in the ability of different kinds of financial sector firms to adapt to technology changes. So one of the things that has slowed the adoption of um, more efficient rules in the marketplace with respect to technology is that small banks and small credit unions are not well positioned currently to take advantage of those advances in technology. And because they're not well positioned to take advantage of them, the small banks and credit unions oppose um, efforts to develop these um, broad-based rules. Um, so there's both a technical problem with small banks and credit unions not being able to access the, the technology and a political problem in that it slows the ad adoption of more efficient rules. Uh, for example, on, uh, on good funds availability, uh, we have um, still today in 2019, um, uh, banks and thrifts and credit unions um, can sit on your funds um, and earn the float from them and not provide instant access to funds, even though technologically we have the capacity to deliver on that today. Um, in the United States. And uh, the reason, a primary reason that good funds availability rules permit that kind of flexibility is because of this problem of differential access to technology among big and small firms in the United States. So a central both political and technological problem. Um, as you're going to hear about um, later today, there are lots of other countries who have made progress um, on these sets of issues. Uh, none of them perfect, all of them involving um, significant um, questions about uh, trade-offs among different values. Uh, but just to give a flavor, obviously you're going to hear quite a bit about uh, GDPR um, in the European Union um, and the framework for um, privacy um, in, that, in, that, um, uh, in that law. Uh, there's been a, a huge progress in the developing world, and I'll just give you know, a couple examples. Um, uh, in India, um, India developed something they call, they call the India Stack, um, which is a set of rules um, designed to promote uh, access and equity and privacy and security in the Indian financial context. Uh, and a core element of that was the development of a national ID program called Adahar, um, a unique ID that is um, uh, it, it provided to all uh, Indian um, citizens and residents and that um, any um, financial institution, any government agency um, can use um, in order to um, open a bank account or provide government services. Now, India rolled this out fast, and they rolled it out um, in some ways with insufficient attention to the kinds of issues I mentioned before about consent and about privacy. And that caused some problems for them legally. Um, in 2018, the Indian Supreme Court upheld the government's use of Adahar, um, but said that when private institutions use it, they need to have real meaningful informed consent. And so the framework for Adahar is being renegotiated now um, to try and take account uh, more deeply of these principles. Um, the, um, uh, another um, uh, example I'll give is um, in Singapore. Um, Singapore has um, really been a leader in open banking. Um, uh, in 2017, um, the government set up a system um, for the easy um, exchange of information through a centralized um, platform. Uh, and that permits uh, you to switch your bank account quite easily. It permits you to link to third-party providers um, of um, uh, apps for budgeting services um, really easily. Uh, and the framework, um, that centralized um, platform, um, has really been, I think, a, an important model. Um, some of you may also um, be familiar with the open banking uh, portal in the UK, uh, which provides um, easy transitions between bank accounts the same way that you currently can, um, unless you're on a long-term contract, you can switch your um, cell phone from carrier to carrier. You can keep your cell phone number, and we're not worried that um, uh, you're switching from AT&T to Sprint, um, although you, you might worry for other reasons. Um, but uh, but uh, we don't have anything similar in the United States for switching your bank, even though 
it ought to be just as easy. We've made it uh, extremely hard um, to do. So uh, what are some of the potential paths forward? Um, one of them is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's authority under Section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act. So um, back when I was in Washington um, uh, working on, on Dodd-Frank, we included a provision um, in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's authorities that gives consumers the right to have access to information about their bank account um, data and usage in a machine-readable format. Um, and that uh, provision we put in there to enhance competition in the marketplace, to give consumers greater control over their financial data. Um, and, um, you know, at the time it was not really, maybe we did too many controversial things in Dodd-Frank, um, because at the time it wasn't really noticed. Um, but um, now that um, uh, the dust has settled a bit on that, um, 1033 um, could provide a significant path, not a full path, not addressing all the issues that I've described, but a significant path forward um, to give consumers better control over their financial data. Um, and um, I would hope that the CFPB would move forward um, on implementing it. Um, I think more broadly, we could develop in the United States a, a, uh, a really comprehensive framework for data sharing uh, with an open banking platform, uh, with an independent uh, entity or existing entity given the authority to oversee it, um, and with clear rules being established for privacy, for security, for consent, uh, for liability, and for consumer protection. And I think that kind of comprehensive framework um, would let us um, uh, move forward in a way that truly enhances consumers' ability to own their own financial data, to use that data, um, and to, uh, as I suggested at the outside, empower consumers to have more control over their financial lives, which I think is the core, the core goal. So um, with that, um, uh, I'm going to skip all these things. Um, with that, let me just say um, it's really been a, um, uh, a pleasure to uh, be with you this morning. Um, I think we have time uh, perhaps for a few questions, um, which I'd be happy to take. So thank you very much. I'll start. Melissa. That was great, Michael. Uh, Melissa Coide, um, how do we know, particularly in the data ecosystem, when there is such unsettled business models, certainty over what the value proposition is for consumers, whether it's a data for financial management PFM tool, or data for underwriting, or data for how am I making long-term investment options? Mm -hmm. With all the uncertainty about what those business models in this ecosystem look like, but yet we know data is flowing in, I'll say it, highly unregulated ways, when do we know is the right time to act from a legal and regulatory standpoint? Like by the time you got to the end of your remarks, you're like, we're there. <laughs> but, but we hear this quite a bit, right? Yeah. Like, wait, let things settle out a little bit before right. we think about regs in this space, or even new laws for that matter. Well, I guess let me answer it in a flip way and then maybe in a more serious way. Like if we think the right time is um, in five years, let's start legislating now. Um, so it takes, you know, it takes forever to get anything done. Um, so it's never, I don't think we're too early to be developing the legal framework. But the slightly less flip it, um, point is, I think that um, the key is to develop um, a legal framework that is agnostic to the developing um, innovations in the market. That is, you know, one, of the, one of the problems that India got into that I didn't mention is, um, they developed, in some ways, a quite innovative um, set of um, structures for non-bank participation in the payment system. Um, but they did it in a way that uh, it's extremely difficult for private parties to develop um, economically viable models. Um, 
But I think that um, if you, and are they rectifying it? they're 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 trying to rectify it. Um, I wouldn't say they they they're in in process. Um, but I think that so so the you, you know the risk you point out is real. But I think that you know if you develop a, a framework that's open as, and is agnostic to those different business models, um, then you know then I think you foster innovation, but you do it in a way that is set in a structure that um, everybody knows what the rules are, liability allocation is clear, we're protecting consumers on the consent and privacy front. Um, uh, so I think having that framework in place in advance actually helps people innovate. You innovate around a uniform um, a system and you do it in a way that is uh, consumer-centered. That is, you know, let's start from the proposition that what we're trying to do is empower consumers to have better control over their financial lives and then let companies innovate on the basis of that principle. So that's what I would say. Yeah? Is uh, consumer-centered as easy to do as it is to say? <laughs> I'll bring up, I mean, I'll bring up a, a question which is ill-formed because I never thought of it until you put up a slide. If, uh, that's, I, that's one of my favorite things to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Makes the slide worthwhile. Or, or, or it indicated how ignorant I am. Um, not sure which it is. Uh, if, if we say consumer-centric is I own my data mm -hmm. and I can uh, prevent you um, my lender from using it for more than two days or for any reason other than to decide whether to lend to me or not, does it exclude other things that might have systematic consumer benefits? For example, being able to audit the quality of loan portfolios. If that data goes away, how do you know whether the decisions were good? Or in the age supposedly of you know, information allowing us to correct errors, if we don't have that information on hand, how do we learn anything new? Like, for example, um, it's not true that you shouldn't lend to people in this neighborhood because we've learned differently. Right. So you might have consumer protection at my level, but systematically, maybe it goes the other way. Yeah. So that's a, a terrific question and, and demonstrates that you're not, in fact, ignorant, Eric, which is not shocking to me. Um, so. Uh, so absolutely. So it may be that the principle we enunciate, you know, at a broad level is time and uh, use limited consent, but we have provisions that um, are broadly beneficial to consumers where we say, but yes, of course, you can also use it for um, these fo the following purposes. So, the, you know, classic is um, information maintained in a credit bureau um, uh, for the purposes of establishing both the individual's creditworthiness and for developing the kind of um, broader sense of, um, of market-wide information that provides positive externalities to, to everybody. Um, or, as you suggest, for purposes of regulatory auditing for issues of fair lending or discrimination. Um, so the, the kind of broad principle that I enunciated would then need a set of um, clarifying limitations um, that suggest when there are positive externalities uh, to the market as a whole, um, those, um, that information might be used for that additional purpose. But it kind of flips it on its head. So instead of saying, as we do, not entirely today, but um, our starting framework is um, if you get consent, you can use it for anything. Uh, and that also has some positive spillovers. We would say, what are the positive spillovers, and then you can use it for those things. Um, in areas where there, there are positive spillovers um, that are largely private, uh, you know, you can imagine different models. So obviously, um, today, uh, you know, many apps and um, uh, technology in the world from, you know, Facebook, you know, uh, on, uh, use the fact that we've provided data to it um, to generate the revenue that um, supports the free app, the free app. Um, and, 
you know, that's a, that's a private business model. We could have a different kind of model where we said, no, actually, you know, it's a pay per use, it's micropayments, it's um, not, a, not a free app with our own data being the revenue generator. Um, but those sets of questions, I think, are different from the kinds that, that you're raising, which are really about, you know, broad public goods provision. Dick. State and local, municipal, and federal governments, yeah. uh, as you and I are all familiar with. Um, where should we start? Um, and how do we <laughs> reconcile, uh, you know, in our own uh, American house, uh, the conflicts that might arise uh, between or among uh, those various branches of government? And then more broadly, when we think about, uh, you know, culturally, it does appear that Europe has a different approach and right. a different view of not just privacy, but as you started your talk about ownership and who owns it. Um, and is there a, a concept of shared ownership under certain circumstances between the, um, the consumer or for that matter, the business and the people with whom they transact? A lot yeah. of questions, but. Yeah, so those are three, three really good questions, um, at least. Um, so, uh, you know, some states are uh, proceeding um, on their own, California passed, um, there was a California ballot initiative that was going to uh, essentially enact wholesale um, into California law, GDPR. Um, and in a modified form, the California legislature, to preempt the, um, the ballot initiative, passed its own um, version of that. Um, they're having a little bit of trouble figuring out what it means um, and how to implement it. And um, uh, some of the provisions um, uh, in the law as originally drafted are, are not, um, not feasible to implement by their own terms. Um, so they're, they're in revisions right now working on that. But I do think that in the current political environment in the United States, having some state-level experimentation might be uh, quite valuable, um, particularly if the state that's experimenting is California or New York. Um, it's going to cause some short-term pain. Um, even if the law were perfectly written, it will cause some short-term pain um, because of um, state-federal conflicts and conflicts between um, among state laws. Uh, so I, I don't want to say it's kind of nirvana to do that approach. Uh, but I do think having California experiment in this will give us some good evidence about what might work and not work in the, in the U.S. context. Not, and, uh, you know, I'd be happy to see experimentation not just on privacy but on, on other issues. Um, fed federal preemption makes that tough in the financial sector, as you know. Um, uh, so it doesn't, you know, doesn't fully um, address these sets of questions, but I think, I think worth pursuing. You know, at the federal level, I actually think there's some ground for optimism about um, bipartisanship. Uh, I think that um, not for all the issues that I raise, but for many of them, um, there are um, senators and representatives on both sides of the aisle who are interested in technology issues and want to see progress being made in the United States and see the U.S. falling behind because our frameworks are not as developed as they could be. Um, so you have, you know, for example, um, Representative McHenry in the House um, has been a um, longtime supporter of um, uh, technological innovation, Senator Peters um, um, from Michigan. So I could see, you know, bipartisan work in trying to make progress on these efforts at the federal level. Um, your last question is really about um, cult you know, different cultural norms across the world, and, and I totally agree with you. I didn't mean to suggest that we should have the same privacy balancing as the UK or India or Singapore or the EU, all of which have made different choices from each other, um, just that we need to be much more serious about the choices that we've made, and I don't think that we've really addressed in any deep way what our own privacy values are. Um, so I'd like us to do that and then embody that in a coherent set of rules that then will spot, you know, foster innovation in the financial markets. 
can you indulge me in a second uh, sure. question or maybe a fourth? It's up to Sophie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, our credit bureaus are a source of misinformation yeah. often because they sort of take as given the information that they collect and don't really validate it. Um, and uh, that's the source of a lot of heartburn for consumers um, who are denied credit or for other reasons. Is there, a, uh, is there a legal remedy for that? Is there some kind of a policy that we could think about that would um, you know, make that more consumer friendly? Yeah, there's actually um, now enough authority um, that they could be better regulated. So um, uh, both um, through individual um, uh, error resolution procedures, but more importantly through the CFPB's ability to provide oversight um, with respect to their activities. Um, and um, I would um, love to see the CFPB, you know, expand its... Um, activities in that space and try and, as you suggest, clean up um, some pretty bad practices. Um, even, with, um, even with greater you know, supervision, it's super hard for um, us to make progress because consumers don't really know what's going on in that um, space. So unless something goes horribly wrong um, in their personal financial lives because of it, uh, you're not going to see those things um, rise enough to the top. So you, you see the, the tail edge of really bad practices and really bad errors that cause harm and less focused on the kind of underlying question about whether um, the quality of the data is adequate and less attention to um, issues of fairness and, and equity, you know, except at the, extreme, the level of extreme harm. Eric wants to go back for more. <laughs> Our students are not usually this shy. Don't be shy. So I'm a bit confused, is what I will say. Um, and I'm wondering if there's differences within legislation and regulation that apply to various tiers of consumers. Because when you started off, you talked specifically about the switching accounts, overdrafting of a specific individual. But then we also talk about the credit bureaus and the aggregated data set of people. And do you actually foresee, are there different regulations at those different tiers? And do you think a common solution can exist for the entire tree? Yeah, I think it makes sense to think about the system as a whole. Um, that is, both about uh, individual level protections um, and also about how the system as a whole operates. So the role of different kinds of data aggregators are really important in that system. Credit bureaus are an important example of a, of a data aggregator, in a sense. Um, uh, so I do think it makes sense to think system-wide. And we could have a, a set of rules that, um, you know, this goes a little bit back to Eric's question, a set of rules that uh, permits the efficient use of data in an aggregated form, uh, but also protects consumers against misuse of that data. So I, I, I don't think of those as separate problems. I think of them as part of an, an integrated system. Um, can you say a little bit about cybersecurity? Part of what scares the crap out of me about India's digital identifier is the fact that it's linked to your biometrics. And um, I think there's probably, there have been points of time in time when I've received no fewer than four different letters warning me that my data was exposed to, you know, some other kind of hacker. I mean, fortunately, I don't use my real information anyway for almost anything, but how do we get around that? Well, um, for those of you who don't know, that's Christy Baer, who is the um, uh, director of the um, Center on Finance, Law, and Policy and does a lot of work for me, and I'm really grateful. Um, and one of the things she does is ask good questions. So um, you should be really worried about cybersecurity. Um, you should be more worried about it today than you were yesterday. Um, 
uh, and the techniques for detection of cybersecurity have advanced, but um, the techniques for doing the cybersecurity have advanced in many ways faster, and it's kind of a race. Um, uh, I also think there are particular problems with biometrics being used for identification because um, once your biometrics are stolen, that's it. There's nothing, there's nothing left. Um, you can't, you know, despite all the kind of James Bond movies, people don't go around, you know, sanding off their fingers and replacing their eyeballs um, to, uh, um, you know, to change their biometric identity. Um, uh, so that, that's uh, quite concerning. Um, uh, uh, in lots of levels. Uh, there are new techniques being used, um, being developed right now that are uh, much more protective of individual identity. They're not really being deployed in the market yet, but um, there are techniques that permit, um, uh, through advanced um, computational technique, permit an outside entity to perform calculations on encrypted data without decrypting the data first. Um, and those techniques will eventually permit us to have our identity in an encrypted form on our person, in our phone, um, and to let uh, an outside you know, lender decide whether to provide credit to us looking at that encrypted data in a masked form. Um, and that will eventually be, uh, I think, a more robust form of protection. Um, you know, there's also, um, at a, at a company-wide level, uh, advances in cybersecurity protection that, um, uh, shift the way in which, um, an entity connects to the internet, connects to the market, um, and slowly changes the nature of those connections in such a way that outside attackers can't tell that the network connection is changing but they can't access it uh, as readily. And those two kinds of techniques, you know, I think are important advances in cybersecurity protection that, you know, buy us some more time to um, maybe get ahead of cybersecurity, cyber attacks. But, but this problem isn't going away, and, and the sort of arms race in, um, in this is going to um, continue. And the kinds of techniques people are developing are not, you know, foolproof um, technique. So you should be worried. Uh, but there's not really a, you know, there's not really an answer to that fully unless you completely get off the grid. Um, and, you know, there are some people in our society who have chosen to do that for, for that and, and other reasons having to do with their own um, uh, personal ideologies. <laughs> um, but it's pretty hard to do um, in a, you know, in a modern economy, impossible to do really in a modern economy. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question. So who is very confident that they have the best question? <laughs> do two more. Okay, we can do two. We can do two more. We'll, <laughs> we'll go over here first. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so in my past life at the CFPB, or BCFP as they are called these days. Uh, and we're back to CFPB. They haven't changed the logo yet, actually. Uh, <laughs> if you go to the headquarters, still BCMP yeah. and uh, the ugly brown color. Anyway, um, so we have, you have talked a lot about privacy issues, uh, but I think uh, some of the, uh, I guess, when, when you talk to aggregators and the banks, uh, when the conversation sort of break down is when the liability question comes right. into play, right? So who's really, I mean, Chrissy asked a question about security. So we all know, no matter how good your security is, at some point it will be breached. And you, you probably have been breached before you even realize it. So what's, what are our thoughts on you know, how, the, how the liability should be allocated among different parties? And, and you talk about consumers in control, but the consumer, frankly, you know, I don't want to bear any responsibility. Right. Right? If I give you my data, it's your job to, to, to keep it, to, to safeguard it. And if there's a breach, you know, I'm going to hold you responsible. And reasonably, I think the banks will say, hey, we are always sort of you know, the last stop. So if anything goes wrong, we're on hook for it. And now, what kind of uh, ability do I have to go after the third party or fourth party or fifth party, which you know, at least at this point, you know, when data is breached, we don't even know who, uh, who the source is. My second question is really sort of follow up on 
the conversation about uh, the data quality or, mm -hmm. or the CRA. Um, so do you think the aggregator should be regulated or supervised as a CRA? Uh, if so, what do you think of the responsibilities of the furnishers, right? So I remember, uh, you know, at a uh, meeting with a very large bank, uh, that was after the election, of course, so the attitude has changed. So <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pushback was, if you, if you made us a furnisher, we're gonna stop sharing the data uh, through the third party to customers. So I think that's just, you know, a, a question for, I don't know if the, the new CIPB leadership is willing to take on that, you know, uh, the challenge. Yeah, I mean, the, the two issues you raised are um, brutally hard. Um, and, you know, really at the core of fights um, currently about um, how to make progress in this space, um, and not surprisingly. Um, so I think we're going to ha have to end up with a set of um, clear liability rules, and I think that at the end of the day, those are likely to fall on um, uh, regulated financial institutions, um, and in particular on depositories, um, uh, in, in part because um, uh, they are the institutions that have the wherewithal to be the last stop. Um, and, uh, and they are um, supervised, so we have a higher confidence in their ability to perform. Um, that doesn't mean that there can't be intermediate levels of liability before the last stop. Um, so we might have um, loss allocation rules that um, start with um, that principle, uh, but permit recovery from third parties where there's um, either fault or whether we want to where we want to um, distribute um, uh, the costs of the compliance system. So I can imagine a um, a system where sort of the first order at the first order level we're relying on supervised financial institutions for liability, and in a secondary level we're um, permitting um, put back um, to the uh, to the vendor. Um, with respect to the furnishing question, I think it's basically the same, um, the same set of um, issues. That is, um, uh, we, want, um, we want aggregation to occur, but we want it to be accurate. Um, you know, how do you do that? Well, you encourage the most provision of, of information, but then you have um, some set of rules about the, um, uh, the um, extent to which the holder of that information um, is responsible for um, checking, verifying um, its accuracy. And so I, I think, um, you know, I'm not sure that I would go all the way to saying um, that all data aggregators are, should be regulated the same way as a credit rating agency, but also we don't have a fully I don't think we have a fully developed um, regulatory system for credit rating agencies themselves, uh, so credit bureaus themselves. So um, uh, I, I do think that we need, you know, a comprehensive approach that would treat um, uh, this class of activity um, the same and certainly not um, leave it uh, really completely unregulated, uh, which is more where it is now. Okay, you've got to make it quick. It's up to you. Gonna, but it's going to be great. And I'll give a shorter answer. <laughs> First of all, Mike, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. So uh, as, you st as you talk about the other, so I, I think I am the first stand uh, who has gone through the other card and enrollment and everything. Uh, it is very tough to, uh, to enroll that plans or to like, you know, uh, do it at a massive scale when we're talking about 1.4 billion uh, people. And what I have seen while enrolling there, so there, will th there, there were like portable devices where you are giving your biometrics, retina scans and everything. And in last couple of years, you might have heard about the news that data bridge. Just pay $10 and you will get maybe like 50,000 people's data in your hand. So I, I think that was one of the biggest bridge happened ever. Uh, in this scale, um, 
and when it when we talk about the india so most of the time it is always the first hand experience ever because there are no experiences available in any of the countries uh, when we are rolling out such a massive scheme for these many people uh, i think there should be some law enforcement or the robust framework well before uh, rolling out these schemes so what is your take on that particular stuff so if suppose united states wants to uh, come up with any uh, any of such stops so what should be those steps like the government come up with in terms of public private partnership or the law enforcement so that should be a smooth process yeah i mean i think one of the um advantages that um uh, India had in that context is that it did like a super fast, um, super fast rollout. It developed all these, um, the the whole sort of idea of the India stack in a very brief period of time, and it tried it. But the disadvantage of that is they had a lot of problems um, in implementation. Um, you know, things on the ground were really super messy and are messy. I had to go back to the drawing board um, in terms of privacy and consent issues with the Supreme Court ruling. They had an absolutely wacky um, demonetization um, effort to, um, well, let me leave aside what its motivation was, um, that was incredibly disruptive. Uh, so I wasn't holding up India as an example of, like, you know, perfection in this case, just that they've experimented in this um, way that is, you know, quite comprehensive and I think innovative. Um, in the U.S. context, you know, the challenge is not quite as stark because, you know, most people in the United States have identification. Most people in the United States already have a bank account. The income distribution is, you know, quite different here from in, from in India. So our challenges in the U.S. context are um, quite modest in comparison, um, and that gives me greater hope that you could have implementation done in a, in a, in a pretty easy way. So thank you all very much.